Chapter 27. Distress Signals. When the walls come tumbling down, when you lose everything you have, you always have family. And your family always has tribe. Family. It wasn't a word I had much use for, nor a concept I'd really had any connection to. I'd never known my father. A quite uncommon situation for a filly growing up in Stable 2. When my mother had been my age, she had spent a large portion of her time being... Well, there were other words I could use for describing other ponies, but this was my mother, and for her, I chose the words promiscuous and inebriated. Growing up, I did have my mother, but my memories of her were largely of the sit quietly while the grown-ups are talking variety. However, she did teach me games, and even though I came to realize, even as a blank flank, that she did so more to alleviate her own boredom, more so than my own, I cherished each happy memory of playing with her. Every game of cards and strategies and brightly colored pieces that the stable had to offer. But even then, I never really thought of us as a family in any way that attached special meaning to the word. Now, through the haze of pain, I realized this was changing. Had changed already, in fact, without my knowing. With the painkillers worn off, and adrenaline no longer propping my body up, I could feel just how much pain I was in. The bandages had helped and probably spared me from bleeding out through the deep slashes in my chest. However, continuing to push myself while injured had harmed more than just my magic. But I was with my friends now. There was a feeling of completeness and safety. My body could finally relax and just hurt. Velvet Remedy had slipped into Mother Doctor mode, almost at the sight of me. Now that I wasn't mentally sniffing between her hind legs anymore, I found myself confronted or comforted by her fretting ministrations, particularly considering that she would did a much better job of mothering me than my actual mother ever did. In truth, these ponies had become my family. Family in that deeper sense of the word that means finding home. Not from the location you are, but from the people you are with. And my family was having an argument. She's a zebra! Steelhoofs exclaimed. He had kept his si silence until we were well away from the wall. But, as we had approached the crumbling ruins of Java's Cup, Steelhoofs had finally questioned the presence of my new companion. I made the mistake of simply saying she was a friend. Yes, she is. I was weary and hurting. My breathing was shallow, and I felt like I was constantly drowning. I needed a bath to wash off the caked blood off my coat, and the stinging powder still chewing into my flank, and the last of the nasty little biting insects that somehow survived along with me. And I wanted a bed that was at least softer than cement. What I did not want was an argument. Who has clearly manipulated you into trusting her? Still who surmised. You can't trust them. Zenith had wisely remained silent, simply choosing to follow as we moved away from the wall and the slave pits of Stern's Philadelphia. But now, nettled and perhaps feeling bolstered by my assertion of friendship, the zebra retorted, The war is long over. I had no part in it. Just because I have stripes does not make me an enemy combatant any more than that armor makes you a soldier in Nightmare Moon's army. Brilliant. Princess Luna's army, snapped the Steel Ranger, who had indeed served in the war 200 years ago. Now over. Not that your kind has any right to even speak the name. He turned to me. Little Pip, what are your intentions regarding the zebra? Please tell me you don't actually expect her to travel with us. Oh, heavens no, Velvet Remedy chimed in. I'm sure she doesn't. After all, it would just be as foolish as to travel with some sort of creature known for degenerating into madness, flesh-eating. 
Zenith drew up, staring at the charcoal-coated unicorn, with a look of bewilderment bordering on resentment. Oh wait, those aren't zebras, Velvet casually finished. Those are ghouls. Steelhoof stopped now too, and I was sure that behind his visor he was glaring. Zenith huffed, still confused. In her exotic accent, she slowly asked Velvet, Are you saying I look like a ghoul? I hung my head. This was going downhill fast. Velvet Remedy's eyes widened as she realized how Zenith had uh, taken the statement. No, of course not, she assured the newcomer, then cryptically mused. But some pony here sure smells like one. Zenith sniffed at her own coat. I rolled my eyes. Then, just to be sure, sniffed at my own. I gagged a little. I was rank. Calamity swooped up to us. He had been waiting for us in front of Java's. Spitfire's thunder held in his mouth. Java had apparently been, based on the large sign collapsed over the door, a milk-colored stallion whose mane was a wavy light brown with dark brown streaks, and whose cutie mark was a steaming cup of what I hoped were coffee beans. But when we stopped moving forward, he decided to close the gap himself. He landed next to me, slipping the magically enhanced anti-machine rifle into a newly fashioned holster on his battle saddle, and offered Zenith a hoof and a smile. Well, howdy! I wanted to kiss him, which was not a desire I normally associated with Bucks. Zenith looked hesitant. She reached out, a hoof tentatively, and then shrank back, wide-eyed, as Calamity took it in both of his forehooves and shook vigorously. Pleased to meet you. I'm Calamity. Her foreleg was still shaking after he let go. Welcome to the team. What is it? Or that is it? She asked cautiously, still looking at Calamity, as if she'd never seen a Pegasus before, which I suddenly realized was probably the case. Ah, oh, shucks, Calamity said, still grinning. I saw you through the scope. Clearly, little Pip here trusts you, and if she trusts you, that's good enough for me. Yes, Velvet said, in a drawling yet ladylike sigh, because Little Pip's judgment has been Celestia tier recently. She was looking over my injuries with growing dismay. Okay, okay. Yes, I know it was a stupid plan. I'm sorry. I looked at my friends desperately. I knew it was going to be bad in there, and I didn't want to put any of you through that. I know I should have trusted you to handle yourselves, and that we should have stayed together. We're stronger together. I'm empathetic without you. I collapsed to my knees, suddenly overcome with fatigue. Velvet Remedy's horn began to glow as she waved everyone around to be quiet and stand back. A moment later, my unicorn friend gapped. By the goddesses! Little Pip! What happened to you in there? Velvet Remedy knelt next to me as I stretched out on my mattress in what had once been a child's bedroom. We had invaded a small apartment building that had once shared a Philadelphia city block with Jabba and his cups. I could see the others in the next room. Calamity was sorting through the small items he had scavenged from the apartment. Zenith was cooking, and Steel Hooves was glowing. I gotta wonder why I even bothered, Calamity mused when he stared at the boards which he had pried from across the door an hour ago. They now served as wood for a campfire. And like any pony who's determined and capable enough to brave inner city ruins is going to be stopped by a couple planks of wood, why would boarding up the door in the first place? Zenith had found some cooking pots and was brewing something sweet smelling over the fire. Several other pots sat around her, each waiting for a turn under the flames. I marveled at her good fortune. Ever since I'd left homage, I had bemoaned our lack of a skilled chef. I winced. What I wouldn't give to see her right now. Instead, she was in mortal peril. And I... I felt myself flush with angry guilt that I wasn't doing something to help her right now. This very instant. I cursed Red Eye. Why did he have to go after homage? I don't figure he did. 
Clement has suggested from the other room. I reckon he's aiming at DJ Pwn3. Buck's been broadcasting good things about you for a while now. So that probably gets him chalked up as a friend that Red Eye figures you'd want to keep from harm. Assuming he hasn't simply surmised that you want to keep every soul from harm, Steelers added grimly, and that you will go to absurd and dangerous lengths to do so. I felt the urge to remind him that it was a Steel Ranger elder who pitched the plan, but I bit back. Steelers had never suggested or pressured me to go along with the solo mission, he merely supported me when I made my decision. Considering the tones of his previous conversation with Elder Blueberry Saber, I suspected Steelhooves would have just as swiftly backed me if my decision had involved telling her to sit on my horn and spin. I looked from Steelhooves to Calamity, again struck by the difference between them when it came to support. Calamity was loyal, Steelhooves was obedient, not necessarily to me, but to whoever he accepted was in charge. He was a soldier buck, even now. Velvet Remedy's glowing horn passed over me once more. She was making sure she had found every injury. As I had expected, my broken rib and punctured lung had drawn the most reaction from her, including a whole heart, a host of dark looks at Zenith and Steel Hooves. Couldn't match. But she commented the z zebra on not feeding me any healing potions, voicing confidence in her mending spells. She gasped as she started to pass her horn over my tail. Little Pip! She leaned close, her voice scandalized and sympathetic. How did you get wounded there? It wasn't me, Zena's voice sounded from the other room. What? Clemente looked up tensely. Who hurt Little Pip where now? I buried my face in my forehoods feeling my cheeks redden with embarrassment. Never you mind, Velvet told the Pegasus sternly, as she opened her saddleboxes and floated out an array of medical supplies. Calamity's scavenging had restocked us very well in that regard. It didn't help that my worry over homage had brought it to half-formed daydreams of the wonderful gray unicorn kissing that very wound to make it better. Gracefully, returning us to the earlier conversation, Velvet Remedy suggested, I know you're worried about homage, but please, try not to let it eat at you. Remember, so long as Red Eye doesn't act on his threat, he has something to threaten you with. Once he does, all he has is an angry little pip. And if he's half as smart as you make him out to be, then he's plenty bright enough to know he doesn't want that. I bit my lower lip. Calamity stood up, shaking his head. I hate to be the voice of worry, but... The Pegasus paused uncomfortably, brushing a hoof over his orange mane. Well, I figure if he put that mega spell on Ten Pony Tower, he must have done so before he hatched this plan to use ya. So, the only thing keeping him from using it is that deal with ya. I frowned. So... Do you think he'll set it off the moment he knows the goddess is dead? I hadn't even considered that. That is, if I do it? Clement nudged his hat. Ah, don't rightly know. But DJ Poem 3 is a discerning voice with a huge audience. Clemente's frown deepened. Most dictatorships I know don't tend to go hell and high water to either discredit or destroy opposing voices like that. I almost asked how, asked how many dictatorships Calamity knew of, but the words died on my lips as a memory floated to the surface of my mind. Don't you believe him, Calamity once told me. The Enclave has a vested interest in making any pony who bucks their ideas into a monster. Instead, I nodded, trying to give him a supportive look. Stern cuts off the tongues of any who speak ill of Red Eye, Zenith reminded me, putting a little extra loathing into the Griffin's name. I spent years speaking nothing so that I might keep mine, she added. It is good to finally use it freely again. Steelhoofs grunted. Now that we're all together, 
I don't see why we can't just call his bluff. Fly in and level his operation. Take him out. I sighed deeply. First, because taking him out wouldn't be that easy. Elder Blueberry Saber was right about that. He's always protected. And he can get out faster than we can get to him. What I didn't say was that I wasn't sure I wanted to flatten his operation. In fact, I was sure I didn't want to destroy the work he was doing. I wanted to free all the slaves. But, that wasn't the same thing, was it? Damn it. It was easy to know my moral stance before I discovered that the evil fucker was also, as best as could be, right. He was building a better future, or at least, parts of one. And he was sacrificing everything for it, from his own home to your freedom. I recalled a conversation with Watcher regarding how, without what he called the spark, the virtues he valued would become twisted, lost parodies of themselves. I found another in Red Eye. Generosity. Even generosity could wander down twisted and dark paths. Especially when you're giving away sh what you're giving away shouldn't be yours to give. Steelhoofs nickered. You don't actually think Steelhoofs has a mega spell, do you? I grimaced. I grimaced. An undetonated balefire bomb. Where would he have acquired something like that? Steelhoofs questioned. Where? It's not like you can stumble over something like that just lying around. Velvet Remedy, Calamity, and I all exchanged looks. Oh no. Steelhoofs groaned. What did you three do? The building was silent, save for the crackling of the fire and the bubbling of the crockpot. For several long minutes, in the wake of our explanation. You gave a balefire bomb over to New Appaloosa. Steelhoofs exploded, pacing in his heavy armor, his metal sheathed tail flickering in emphasis with each word. A town notorious for trading with red eye slavers. Yep. Which one of you idiots came up with that idea? Steelhoofs demanded. I silently tore through my enemy, my memories. I remembered being concerned about sending the freed slaves back to Appaloosa. Stunningly, I couldn't recall having the same concern about giving them a mega spell. Clement raised his hoof. A chagrin expression on his face. This is, Zenith asked, why they call you Calamity, yes? Velvet Remedy moved to sit by Calamity's side. Steelhoofs was fuming. Do you realize that Red Eye is the only reason there is even a new Appaloosa, right? His visor turned towards us and found only blank expressions. That place was a small town dying in the dust before Red Eye pranced in and gave them a water talisman. You've got to figure they owe him. Clement shook his head. Genuinely surprised. Sorry, partner. But that's a new one on me. I, however, merely groaned, putting my hooves over my eye. I saw the bounty of our stable shared. The water talisman given to a struggling town which now knows the joys of clean and pure water. Hobbage was going to die, and it was my fault. My pit buck was clicking at me, not letting me ignore that the water I was blaving in was radioactive. Velvet Remedy had a dose of Radaway sitting nearby for me to consume as soon as I got out of the grossly stained tub. Pure water was a rare treat in the wasteland. Even those who had it would not think to surrender it or squander it on baths. Not unless they lived someplace with a water talisman, like Ten Pony Tower, and in the Philadelphia ruins all the water was to be found and irradiated. The clicking of my pit buck reminded me 
that in my weeks in the Equestrian Wasteland had been, in many ways, blessed. I had avoided some of the more repulsive hardships that many ponies faced every day. I had never been reduced to drinking radioactive water from the bowl of a toilet. There wasn't much of a wall left between this apartment's bathroom and the living room, so I was effectively bathing in front of them. Zenith was still tending to her boiling pots. Velvet Remedy moved between helping me scrub places that I normally called on my magic to reach, and watching Calamity as he tinkered with broken radios he had found in the other apartments, rebuilding one with parts cannibalized from the others. Steel Hooves stood guard near the door. The radio Calamity had been rebuilding fled to life. Yeehaw! Welcome, ponies, to Philadelphia. This is DJ Pwn3, beaming the light into the darkest of places of the Equestrian Wasteland. You can't stop the signal, baby. And thanks to that kid from Stable 2, the message is reaching, reaching even the souls in that trapped, celestial forsaken hellhole. Looks like our plucky stable dweller galloped into the heart of Red Eye's slavery operation and gave the old bastard a big black eye in the form of losing nearly half his deriggables and a small army's worth of his slavers, not to mention annihilating the crater boss. And she even took that red-eyes, right-hoof griffin, stern, down a peg. And that's not all. Our little wasteland heroine, our bringer of light, bucked right through the wall that red-eye had built around Philadelphia's airwaves bringing my humble message into the one place I could never reach before. Thank you, Stable Dweller. I sunk deeper into the bath and moaned. The elation I felt hearing Homage's voice, disguised as it was, in this horrible place, battled the humiliation and dismay at hearing my royal fuck-up described as a brilliant victory. I did not turn this. If you should happen to see our Lightbringer, Give her a big thanks. She'll be easy to recognize. Should she keep in the company of the zebra slave she rescued as icing on the cupcake in her latest escapade. And for the rest of you still toiling away in Philadelphia, our hearts go out to you. And your plight has not been forgotten. Plus, I offer these small words of hope. Knowing our Lightbringer, I don't think she's done with Red Eye yet. Zena stared at the little radio blinking slowly. How does he know so much? She had walked across the moat and outside the wall less than three hours ago. The zebra looked at my companions. And why does he not give you the credit you deserve? Much of the victory was yours, as was our escape, for which I was most thankful. Clemity chuckled. Ah, shucks. Toward nothing. Velvet Remedy purred. Because we asked, DJ Pwn3, not to mention us. Little Pip here should get all the credit. I groaned. It was a conspiracy. I started to get up and say something, but Velvet Remedy put a hoof to my muzzle and whispered into my ear. Oh, and don't think I've forgotten about that barn door comment. She smiled as I collapsed with a splash under the weight of my embarrassment. DJ Pwn3's voice continued bringing news and advice to the ponies of the Equestrian Wasteland. I felt a chill as DJ Pwn3 talked openly with us, having no idea she was in mortal danger. Warning to all those traveling Equestria. Keep your hooves away from the areas surrounding Ponyville. I'm getting reports of fires along the back end of the Everfree Forest. They seem to be spreading slowly, though the advancing flames and smoke are pushing many of the forest's unpleasant inhabitants towards the Ponyville side of the Nightmare Zone. And at least a couple monsters have actually wandered their way into the town itself. Fortunately, the only ponies living in that area are raiders. So, to the monsters, I say bon appetit. Well, if it ain't one thing, tis another, Calamity Nade, pointing out the splendid valley was beyond Ponyville on the opposite side. Fortunately, we would be crossing the area well above ground level so we should be able to fly clear of any trouble. Unless, of course, the critters wandering out of that place include manticores or the like. Knowing my luck, 
and the Equestrian Wasteland's maliciousness, they would be angry dragons. Well, it's hard. Another hard day in the Equestrian Wasteland. But I've got the news and the music to get you through. So say bye-bye to Stupid Static, and hello, Magnificent Music. This has been your host, DJ Pwn3. The voice of Homage, his broadcast persona, gave way to the one newer song of DJ Pwn3's playlist. Something from a record I had rescued out of Stable 29. Do you dream? I felt immensely better after the bath. As Velvet Remedy wove her horn around my broken body, mending my rib and lung with her beautiful magic, I began to drift to sleep. Stu has walked in. Little Pip, can we talk about the zebra? I raised a long, suffering sigh. This again? Lamely pretending to mishear, I replied. Candy Hawk? Sorry, I don't think I've heard of her. Funny, Steelhoof said dryly. Little Pip, I need to talk to you. You need to go to the zoo. Fine. You need the four of us to come with you? I put a little emphasis on the number four, only to realize that with Pyrelight, it should have been five. Where was that magnificent bird anyway? Snickering softly, Velvet Remedy stood up and trotted over the Steel Ranger, head down. She pressed against him wrapping him with a telekinetic field of her own, reducing the massive weight of his armor so that she could shove him out the door. Sorry, Steel Hooves. Too busy saving Equestria today. All prejudice has to be rescheduled. Is next month good for you? Steel Hooves nickered with a stomp. You might accept having one of those traveling with you, but even if I did, there is no way the Steel Rangers will let her trot into their citadel and live. He looked at me over Velvet's scarlet and gold streaked white mane. Or, am I wrong that you have further business here? I buried my face as I realized the ghoul stallion had a point. Stable Tech's old headquarters had intended to be my first stop. I had some things to discuss with Elder Blueberry Saber. But that wasn't some place I could take Zenith. I'd have more luck walking into the Steel Ranger Citadel with an alicorn in tow and trying to convince them she was friendly. Velvet Remedy had him all the way through the door when I finally said, Steel Hooves, I've welcomed Zenith to join us. She's here as long as she wants to be, and if that's a problem for you, then you're free to be elsewhere. I stared at him with what I hoped was a gentle expression. Remember, Applejack herself offered her hooves in friendship to a zebra. The response I got back was an unexpected growl. Yes. And if you knew how that ended, you wouldn't speak of it. Wow. Minefield. Okay. But somehow, I've become the leader of this merry band of ponies. And I've decided to give her the chance. If you want to stay with us, you will too. I won't have Zenith mysteriously disappearing when my back is turned. Velvet Remedy's ga gasped sharp. She gasped sharply at my insinuation. She didn't know the patterns of behavior I had seen in Apple Snack's memories, and looked appalled that I could suggest one of us was capable of such a thing. I envied her for her innocence. Stilus himself was silenced. So long as you are with us, you will love and tolerate the shit out of her. Consider that an order. I stared at him, giving him one chance. That said, I added, reluctantly, you are absolutely right about the Steel Rangers. I won't be bringing her with us into the stable tech building. Which, ugh, means you'll have to split up again. If only briefly. Steel Hoof stood there for a moment then gave a rigid nod. As he turned to trot away, he nearly ran into Zenith, who was trotting up with a small, covered cook pot hanging from her mouth. They stared at each other awkwardly, then danced around each other. Velvet Remedy backed up, letting Zenith through the doorway, 
and then closed it behind her. Zenith lowered her neck, placing the pot on the floor. Once again, it would seem that I am the subject of an argument. You were the subject of an argument, Velvet Remedy corrected gently. Is that not what I said? The zebra asked, perplexed. I covered a snicker with a hoof. Velvet Remedy gave up with a roll of her eyes. And what is that? She asked, pointing at the crockpot with a hoof. Her ears tilted back. Please tell me there's no meat in that. Zenith looked quite surprised. Of course not. Zebras are vegetarians. As I thought, we're ponies. Are you not? I could see the relief wash over Velvet Remedy, as a look of joy broke out over her face. Yes! Yes, we are! Thanks, Celestia! Finally! She slid up to Zenith, wrapping a foreleg around her neck, seemingly oblivious to the way Zenith suddenly tensed. Oh, we are going to be the best friends, you and I! Velvet Remedy backed up, looking over Zenith. And, little Pip isn't the only one in need of medical attention. The mother-doctor side of Velvet was instantly back in control, as she pulled to the top of the mattress off a set of bunk beds, and instantly glided Zenith to it. But the nudge to lie down was the final straw. Zenith jumped away, spinning, and knocking back Velvet Remedy's nudging hoof, with enough force to send Velvet stumbling back with a tear in her eye. I do not like to be touched, the zebra spat. Velvet Remedy blinked, falling into her haunches, holding a bruised forehoof against her breast. I felt like I was frozen. Part of me needed to jump between them, to do something. But the situation had changed so rapidly, my brain was still catching up. Oh, Velvet Remedy blinked. Her eyes widened. Oh! She started back at this tense zebra mare with an expression flooded with compassion. Oh, Zenith, I'm so sorry. She had not told any pony that number four had... I had not told any pony what number four had told me about Zenith's abuse. I did not feel I had the right. Velvet Remedy didn't need me to. She had figured it out for herself. Not the details, thank the goddesses, but enough. Gingerly, I put a sword hoof down. Uh, gingerly putting her sword hoof down and standing, Velvet Remedy apologized again, but without apology came instance. I will not actually touch you casually without permission. That was wrong of me. But I'm a medical pony, and I need to touch you to treat your physical wounds. I can do that well enough on my own, Zenith nickered. Velvet nodded. I'm sure you can, but I can do it better. There was no boast. And after Velvet, Velvet had been able to treat my rib and lung, there was no question she was right. You deserve a lot better treatment than you've been getting. From others in the extreme, but also from yourself. Let me give you the level of care you need, Velvet whined. At least, to the best of my abilities. Zenith neighed. I came in here to deliver a gift to this little one. Not to be prodded and treated by a medical pony. They both looked at me. I was half tempted to pretend I couldn't hear them again. Ugh. Our family had clearly grown big enough that some pony needed to lay ground rules. But why should it be me? Considering my whole lack of a family experience, wasn't I the least qualified? Zenith, I said gently. In this group, we have to trust each other with our lives every day. We care for each other, and each one of us uses our talents to help all of us. I stopped, as I recognized my line of thought was wandering. Readjusted. You are very welcome here, and I do hope you'll stay with us. But being a part of this group will call for some sacrifices. You told me that I was responsible for you now, and that includes making sure you were properly cared for. And this is how I choose to do that by having Velvet Remedy care for you, like she cares for the rest of us. I looked at the zebra, adding, unless you choose to release me from my responsibilities. Zenith's eyes narrowed, 
but slowly, she lay down on the mattress. No, I do not, little pony. I let out a breath. I hadn't realized I'd been holding. Velvet Remedy moved carefully towards the zebra. She stopped as she passed the small cook pot still resting on the floor. She sniffed at it. Zenith, what is this gift? It's a restorative brew, Zenith told us. It will replenish and heal your horn of the magics you overtaxed in our rescue. I blinked. On one hoof, this was extreme, welcome news. The last time I had burned out, it had taken days to recover. With Red Eye's threat hanging over homage, I couldn't afford to be ineffective that long. On the other hoof, I couldn't help but question what a zebra could know of unicorn magics, much less remedies for uniquely unicorn ailments. I know many of the ancient mystical recipes, ones to cure, to enhance, and to harm, Zenith told us. If I have the right ingredients, I can brew potions that will permanently alter and strengthen you, making you better fit for the fight ahead. Alter. I didn't think I wanted to be altered. This is not such a potion, but I have what is necessary to craft one of these elixirs. One which will strengthen your bones, such that they will be much harder to break. I will brew this for you, if you allow me to. Velvet Remedy looks skeptical. I'm not sure that's such a good idea. Nor this gift, for that matter. Before either of us could protest, Velvet reminded me. Little Pip has had some bad experiences with zebra medicine before. She is particularly susceptible to their dangers. Zenith looked between us. I will not offer an addictive drought, nor give a cup too full. The zebra frowned at Velvet, then turned to me. You have said that here you allow each other to share their talents. Will you not let me share this one with you? Velvet nickered at the way Zenith used my own argument so swiftly. The zebra cocked her head. You have seen Red Eye, have you not? That pony has augmented himself with machines and technology. If the little one truly chooses for him to be her mortal enemy, then should she not take advantage of the gifts I offer her? If Red Eye is also my enemy, should I not offer them? My answer was to get up, walk to the cockpot, and lift away the lid. The brew inside smelled sweetly spicy. The steam that rushed out cleared my sinuses. With only the slightest hesitation, I began to drink. My magic had been completely spent. After drinking Zenith's potion and a night of rest, I still couldn't lift the now empty cook pot, but I believe I could feel the stirrings of my magic. And I knew one test which called for only the tiniest spark of focus and power. I laid one of the memory orbs on the apartment floor. I had sacrificed all, save for the two I had taken from the safe in my battle with the Super Alicorn. But these two had been put in the other saddlebag. I laid down, leaning forward and concentrating as I touched my horn to the orb. Flashes of light burst across the night. Scores of cameras capturing the moment of a mob of news ponies and paparazzi. They fixed with a throng of ponies, shouting protests and holding signs in their mouths. My host was standing on a set of marble steps, looking down on them, and watching a quartet of armored police ponies push their way through. I was encased in armor, but unlike my experience in the mind of Applesnack, this armor did not feel heavy or claustrophobic. I could, in fact, barely feel it at all. The limited vision, the eyes forward sparkle, that played behind the visor and the smell of the trapped pony sweat were the swiftest indications of how I was clad. A very nice scent of mare sweat, and I could not help myself thinking. With an unpleasant shock, I realized I could feel wings. I was in a Pegasus pony. 
To each side of me stood more pegasi, wearing the sleek, black, carapace armor I had come to associate with the Enclave. As the police ponies broke through the front of the crowd below and started up the steps, I could clearly see they were escorting a zebra, bound in chains and encircled by the armored police. One of them stepped forward, speaking to some pony just behind me. We caught her in iron shot firearms, red hoofed, trying to steal the schematics for the anti machine rifle. The zebra protested her treatment. I haven't both broken any rule. I was invited there, you fool. Her accent was like Zenith's, and I recognized the odd rhyming that seemed to flow in her speech. Lowering her voice loudly, Zakora asked the lead pony, So, are you always such a tool? I knew it! cried a familiar voice from behind me. The pink party pony advanced into view, glaring daggers at the zebra. And to think, I let you trick us into trusting you. You, you trickster! The coral looked hurt. Pinkie Pie didn't relent, breaking into furious sing-song. She's an evil enchantress, she does evil dances. Pinkie Pie, you have me wrong. I am not like your foolish song. Don't try to entrance me, Zakora. I... Never again. Pinkie Pie turned from her, scowling. It was the first time I had seen the Ministry Mayor of Morale angry. And it was terrifying. In a low voice, she grumbled. I hope you really like rocks. Pinkie Pie looked up at me. Then jabbed a hoof towards two of the armored pegasi on my right. You and you, help escort my old friend, Pinkie Pie hissed the words between clenched teeth, to the convoy. Zakora will be spending the rest of her life as a guest of Shattered Hoof. Tell them that I want all of that zebra's memories. And don't be too gentle. The two pegasi on my right rushed to obey. Pick up my point of her hoof at me. You, with me. The pink earth pony stomped back into the, up the steps and into what I assumed was a ministry building. My host turned and trotted after her, following behind Pinkie Pie as she crossed the darkened, spacious lobby towards the elevators. Under her breath, Pinkie Pie continued to sing venomously. She'll mix an evil brew and swallow you up in a big tasty stew. She stopped singing in the elevator, which was good, since the song would have clashed unpleasantly with the lullaby version of March of the Paris Sprites that was playing inside the lift. Pinkie Pie turned and pushed all the buttons simultaneously with a rump. The elevator took us directly to a large office with a large plate glass window which looked out over Canterlot. Pinkie Pie strode dangerously into the middle of the room, then turned, fixing me with a sort of malevolent expression that made me think she might carve me up and bake me into a cupcake. Then, in a magical instant, she broke into a huge smile that seemed to light up the room. She waved a hoof in a sweeping bow, her voice bursting with joy. Acting! The aging pink earth pony collapsed on the floor in a fit of giggles. Best prank ever! My host trotted over to the window, looking down below. The eyes forward sparkles started identifying ponies and wagons in the street below. The convoy carrying Zakora to Shattered Hoof was already rolling out under light guard, supplemented by the two pegasi in magically powered armor. I felt myself lift the visor. In the window, my reflected face was blue, with magenta eyes, and a shock of rainbow-colored hair matted between them. Pinkie Pie's reflection appeared in the window next to me. Zakora's gonna be alright, she asked, a note of concern in her voice. Won't she, Dashi? I saw and felt my host nod. She's been with the best trainers that the Ministry of Austin has. I won't let this move forward if it were otherwise. Pinkie Pie nodded and turned her stare to the convoy below. It was already two blocks away. Pinkie Pie paused, 
lifting her left forehoof and wiggling it. Huh? Rainbow Dash ignored this, eyes narrowing. Extraction by traitorous zebra sympathizers in three, two. Pinkie Pie looked down excitedly. Ooh, Sakura is gonna make such a good spy. One. There was a flash down below as the first wagon in the prisoner convoy exploded. Dark figures rushed in from all sides, amidst flashes of muzzle fire. Rainbow Dash pushed down her visor. And here we go. I sat in the apartment common room, trying to float small objects. I had made it up to levitating a pack of bubblegum, which honestly was the only thing I managed to it was the only thing I imagined the package was good for anymore. Who would even try to eat 200-year-old bubblegum? Over breakfast, a meal which, in content, was indistinguishable from dinner, the conversation had turned towards more open instructions, and an attempt by the others to get to know Zenith a little better in return for regaling her with stories of our adventures over the past five weeks. I have never seen a Bloodwing, Zenith admitted, but I have seen the descented husks of their prey that they leave behind. Still, wouldn't a missile be a little excessive for killing one? Steelhooves ain't never been one for underkill. The ghoul snorted. You should talk. Tell her about your solution to the Olicorns chasing us through Manhattan. Actually, Velvet Remedy interrupted. I think it's Zenith's turn to share. She gave the zebra an encouraging look and suggested, Why don't you tell us about where you learned these brewing skills of yours? Velvet was purposely suggesting tales of a time that must have been before Philadelphia, steering the zebra's memories and her conversation away from more dangerous and harmful paths. Zenith hesitated, but relented as the silence stretched out. I learned the brewing of potions and remedies, both mundane and magical, from my grandparents. In their youth, they had been adventurers of sort, prying into all the forbidden places, even dwelling into the ever-free forest in search of the hut of Zakora, and braving Lookout Plateau that rises above the dark fumes of Froggy Bottom Bog, along the vilest stretches of Pony Tomic, searching out old recipes and lore of zebra kind that have been over a century lost. It is from them that I learned the ways and tales of the zebra people, or as much as I know of them. I looked up from my task of stacking bubblegum and bullets into a tiny fort. Somehow, the idea of zebras as equestrian scavengers, not unlike myself, was surprising. I didn't know what I had expected. Something more military and uniquely zebra, I guessed. My great-grandparents were among the survivors of Stable 3, as were most zebras in the equestrian wasteland. As is typical for my youth, my grandparents rebelled against their parents' ways and sought to learn more about the zebras beyond the tales passed down through oral tradition since the sealing. I didn't need clarification on what the sealing was. No pony who had lived in a stable would. But I did wish to know more about the stable whose floor plan I had in my pit buck. Stable three? Still was grunted. The let's get along stable, he snorted, the reversibly. I saw Velma's ears pick up. It was clearly an experimental stable, Steelhose rumbled. Virtually all of the zebra citizens of Equestria were randomly assigned to Stable 3. They would have made up half the stable's population. Zenith frowned at the unpleasantness of the interruption, but nodded at Steelhoof's assessment. It was long before even my grandparents' time, but the stories passed down say that the overmares told all in the stable why they had been chosen, and why the stable had no texts of history or posters of current events. Ah, instead of altering things, Skrulu and her friends had simply filtered out as much of the Ministries of Image's influence as possible. Velvet Remedy questioned, 
Over mirrors? Plural? Zenith nodded. One pony and one zebra. My experiences with stables was clawing at the back of my mind. Still, if there were survivors, what went wrong? Why would you assume something went wrong? Zenith gave me a questioning look. Zebras and ponies can live together quite harmoniously, if each gives other the opportunity. Each gives the other the opportunity. Steel hooves again provided the answer I was looking for. Stable three was built within the limits of one city in Equestria, with more than a hoof full of zebras. He informed us. Canterlot. Oh no. Zena saw my expression, and nodded glumly. Not even the stables could hold back the pink cloud forever. Stable 3 lasted over a century before the cloud ate its way inside. With a generation more, those who still could were forced to unseal the door and flee. Many did not survive the exposure. My great-grandparents were among those who did. You killed a dragon? Zena stared between Calamity and me, her eyes wide. They narrowed as she asked me. Is this true, or is this revenge for Doom Bunny? Doom Bunny? Velvet asked curiously. Calamity pulled a book from his saddlebags. I'm guessing something to do with this. I focused, trying to wrap the book in a magic field of magic. I broke in sweat but the book dutifully floated over to me on a cushion of levitating energy. Martial Arts of the Zebra, announced the title. Where did you find this? I asked as I flipped the book open to the contents page. File and cabinet at the station, Clemente said, matter-of-factly. Strangely, it was under P. I shrugged that off. The prologue spoke of the Zebra's rich history of martial artistry. From the many fighting styles that had been perfected over the centuries, such as Fallen Caesar style, to newer ones, the newest of which had been only in existence for a couple of years at the time of this pre-apocalyptic book had been written, and focused on drug-enhanced martial prowess, Doom Bunny style. The book's author spoke ill of it for having undefined influences from the land of the ponies. I closed the book intending to read it later. Zenith tapped a hoof and thought. Little Pip, with your permission, there is some place I would like us to go. I understand that there are other matters that are pressing, but this is important to me. Of course we... Wait, how come this is my decision? I looked to the others. Why do you ponies keep acting like I'm the leader? Little Pip's right. Clamity neighed. Anyway, we do have pressing matters. So, I think we should first hear the plan. What's next? I nodded, thankfully, and laid out the plan. We need to go to Stable Tech headquarters first. I have something that Elder Blueberry Saber wants, and I plan to use it to barter for access to the Stable Tech mainframe. Steel lives wine questioningly. Red Eyes is building a stable called the Cathedral, where Stable 101 used to be. I figured the Stable Tech mainframe has a record of the location of all the stables, so that's the fastest way to find out where Red Eye's main base is located. I looked at Calamity. After that, I said we fly as fast as we can to Tenpony Tower and begin an evacuation. Calamity smirked and turned to Zenith. I'm sorry for interrupting. Just Proven a point. Now, go on with what you were saying? I blinked. Lost. Huh? What point? Zenith gave her own smirk back, answering kindly. I believe you demonstrated to everyone but yourself why you are the leader. I stared. What did she... Oh, fuck. I shot Calamity a dark look. But the buck just grinned. Luna clapped me with her hind leg. Her wings. You could go yourself, Steelhoof suggested to Zenith. 
as non nastily as he could. Zenith nodded. Yes, but the journey would be long and dangerous alone. I would prefer to arrive later than not at all. She looked to me. Although, should you refuse, then I will take my leave as soon as your travels bring us within a few days of my destination. I nodded. I wanted to immediately agree, but it seemed wise to ask. Where do you need to go? I need to return to my tribal home, the village that had been mine and my family's until certain slavers descended upon it. Your family? My parents and husband were slain in the fight. My daughter, the zebra choked before plowing on. My daughter was too young for stern slaver pits. And not a pony, so she would have no place in red-eyed schools. So Stern left her there, along with the other children. Velvet Remedy whimpered, shredding the tears that the zebra seemed unable or unwilling to. My own thoughts traveled back to the words of one of the raiders in Shattered Hoof, speaking about how their own town had been treated the same, with the children left behind to defend themselves. She had fled into the life of a raider to escape the horror of her town, and descended into under the rule of those water scared bullies and traumatized children. It was long ago, years. I doubt my daughter would know me, should she still be alive. Zena's face was sorrowful, but her voice was steady. Any claim I had as her guide and guardian, I lost in the years since. I only wish to know 